What if every think tank, university, and company organized themselves to remove a gigaton of carbon from the atmosphere? This is the Lovers of Exchange, where we think about questions like this. I'm your host, Jimmy Gia. Today, I'm joined with Kaya Axelson, the Net Zero Policy Engagement Fellow here at Oxford University. We both work on systems change, and we learned other tidbits by reflecting on the Season 3 podcast interviews. This episode is sponsored by the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, Saeed Business School, Oxford University. Please don't forget to subscribe and enjoy the episode. Well, Kaya, thank you so much for joining us again. It's great to have you back. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It was so fun last time. I couldn't help it. Excellent. Good. Well, one interesting thing about both of us is that we spent a good deal of time in Seattle. So I wanted to start by asking what some of your favorite memories in Seattle. Yeah, Jimmy, I've actually spent most of my life in Seattle. Um, So I think the the story that I um, probably want to tell is one that shows you just how much of my life I've spent in Seattle. It was around the 1999 WTO riots. Um, So uh, I would have been very young at the time, but I still remember this. Um, My grandmother had just moved to Seattle, uh, practically moved in with us at that stage. I think she was living with us then. Um, and she was uh, she was getting a little senile. She was getting um, she had Alzheimer's, but it was sort of early at the time. My grandma was a very activated woman. You know, she read the newspaper every single day, even deep into her dementia. So um, I just remember this story because um, my grandma f- had this presence about her where she just wanted to be where the action was. And I remember my parents were starting to feel very nervous um, around this time because there was a lot going on in the city. Uh, I mean, it felt like half the city was mobilized. Um, there's a there's a, a favorite rap song that I have um, called 50,000 Deep. Um, and it's just about the, the, you know, the boots on the ground marching to downtown. And my grandmother sort of <laughs> said, you want to go? And my, when my, gra- my dad wasn't looking, she and I just started wandering towards the riots. Um, and, you know... <laughs> Riot is a strong is a strong word. There was a lot of really peaceful, really well coordinated protest, and they they shut down the meeting of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and my dad, I think, caught up to us about halfway downtown as we were wandering with the masses of people. Um, and you know, and my dad is one to talk because later he he was in a kayak, you know, blocking the the new sort of shell Arctic explorer that was trying to leave the port. So I think you know he was being a dad in that moment, but later he was like get on you know I think the, my grandma won him over in the long term but that's my favorite story about Seattle and sort of the power of mass mobilization that we saw in 1999. And it definitely shows your background of being an activist environmental activist in all different sorts of ways. I guess my favorite memories of Seattle having lived there for over a decade is really the food. A lot of my stories mm-hmm. around Seattle revolve around just the freshness and especially the seafood that happens. Yeah. One of my favorite memories is just walking down to Pike's Market, which is one of the largest farmer's market and still is a farmer's market to this day, and just buying fresh vegetables, buying salmon. One of the stories I love telling about salmon is that in most part of the world, you get Atlantic salmon, you get Scottish salmon, you get Pacific salmon. But in Seattle, you choose your salmon by which river, depending on which season it is. Yeah. And so it's the sockeye salmon or the Copper River salmon or the king salmon, but they're very, very specific, uh, yeah. much more specific than what I was used to having grown up in other places. Absolutely. Salmon is is sacred to our area, right? I mean, I grew up with stories about how you have to thank the salmon before you eat the salmon. And um, no, it's uh, we're so blessed with water in Seattle. We're so blessed with water. And we can see that with the shipping industry and the maritime, the port is just right yeah. there next to downtown and the, the large ships just come in and out. That gets us to one of our interviewees for this season, uh, James Mitchell, when he worked on the Poseidon principles that was trying to decarbonize the maritime sector. What was some of the things that you thought about that interview? I have so, so much respect respect for James's work um, and the work of the Rocky Mountain Institute. You know, talk about people who didn't just uh, d- dip their feet into sustainability recently, right? They've been they've been around the longest and convening the heaviest emitters 
for the longest to try to sort of um, build high level agreements um, that are also practicable. And um, one thing that I have noticed in my work recently and just sort of watching the climate space is that we have now a proliferation of these um, kind of agreements, of these coalitions. You know, corporate leaders have realized that it's an easy win for them to sort of pile in. Amazon, for example, you've got the new Amazon Climate Pledge, and then that's different from the previous pledges that Facebook started or the, you know, and so you have all of these different pledges. And it's, I think, um, it, it's hard to know what's going on underneath to ensure that the actions are being taken. And one thing that really makes me feel confident, and, and there's very few things that make me feel confident that what's underneath a lot of pledges is really uh, the action at the scale that we need. There's always a little bit of action, but action at the scale we need. Um, but one thing that makes me confident are people like, like um, James and people who are calling the folks up, who are convening them in a meaningful way, and then are doing the research to give them the information that helps them expand the opportunity space and make them turn a, a no, we couldn't do that, that's not within our business model, to a yes. And Rocky Mountain Institute has been doing that for so, so many years to be able to say, there is a business case for this. The return on investment might not be for a few years, or maybe it's immediate, um, but here's the research and, and we've actually just done it for you. Well, like, there were a couple of things that were fascinating to me about that conversation, one of which was that they just simply chose a single metric. When yeah. you read the entire Poseidon Principle documentation of what it is that they're going to be reporting against, it's not this long litany of mm -hmm. indicators of everything they have to do. It is just one very simple indicator, which is dollars per emissions, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And these financial banks then have now a single metric that they can use to measure their entire portfolio against. Yeah. And you know, I think we get caught up in this mantra these days of more data, more data, more data. Mm -hmm. And they just went, we're only going to choose one. Mm -hmm. We're going to choose the most important one, which is tied to decarbonization. Yes, that's so, so genius. And I actually, I spoke with um, James's team fairly recently. I was, I was fortunate enough to check in with them about their restructure that they did at RMI. And they did something similar for their entire organization. They restructured RMI so that every team is working on at least a gigaton of carbon. Imagine if every mm -hmm. academic in the world who cared about climate change, every think tank, every corporation, every foundation said, is what I'm go doing going to contribute to one gigaton of carbon? That's a level of simplicity that, you know, you can get complexity from there, but it's a level of simplicity that we all kind of could feel good about. We could all say, yes, what I'm working on is associated with this much emissions. And maybe that won't work for everything. You know, maybe there's a lot of people doing a lot of real good that's like at a smaller scale, uh, but... I, I like the ambition there. That's actually a really good way of organizing it. It could be a small contribution to a larger gigaton project, yeah. but it's all aligned towards one direction. I was talking to a academic publisher a, a couple of years ago, and one of the questions they asked was, you know, how can we as a publisher become more supportive of mm -hmm. climate change? And the answer that they got from most other people was, well, cite my work. And I'm sitting there going, like, you got to be kidding me. Just cite as an academic publisher, <sighs> citations does not decarbonize the world. I citations know. props up the careers of academics. The citations are important, but in order to decarbonize, we have to actually have that real world uh, action in yes. initiative in some sort of a way. Citations will not decarbonize the world. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. I think this happens in every industry. I happen to be in academia, so that's what I see. But people um, mistake the, uh, the they mistake the job for the goal, right? And the job is not the goal. Just because you can achieve success in your job, uh, does not mean that you are actually aligned with your purpose. And maybe this goes back to a little bit more of what Shruti was saying about mindset and grounding and, and silence so you can get in touch with yourself and what you're guided by. Because otherwise, there's a lot of pressure to say that, you know, success equals citations or success equals, you know, a number of transactions in the, in the finance sector. And so much of what we do is have to radically restructure those incentives. We were talking about that today with my team about how do we, do we do 
teaching buyouts, research buyouts, so we can get our academics to spend more time with us on the big strategy of how we have emissions by 2030, because that's what would require to get their attention span. In one of the previous seasons that we talked about, there are some leaders, corporate leaders that are incentivized based on the financial return, some based on corporate managers. But then there's another very large population, typically middle managers, that are incentivized based on the volumetric production of whatever good that they are manufacturing. Yeah. And when you have a volumetric uh, goal, it's really hard to think sustainably since in in many ways, increasing volume is a unsustainable activity. Yeah. And but this does come from the top down. So the you know the, the leaders maybe have a little bit more time to think about the direction. Um, but the direction of travel has been shareholders rather than stakeholders. Uh, can I ask you a question about this? Which is that um I have friends in really coming from the kind of thinking about how do we reform the private sector who are putting forward um, new laws like the Better Business Act to try to reform um, corporate laws. So, And it's a little different between the UK and the US, but basically they're trying to reform fiduciary duty to be more inclusive of our duties to our planet and to our stakeholders and people. Um, What do you you think about that? Is that the right approach? Is that the right mechanism? Or, Or, you know, what what mean, do we need to do in addition to that to change incentives? So there's a huge body of work here at Oxford on responsible business and the purpose of business. And what you're talking about ties greatly into that. When we look at the history of business going back just even within the last hundred years, capital used to work for people. And so you would put capital to work in order to fund small businesses, in order to fund Mm -hmm. projects, initiatives, economic development in rural communities was a really big proponent of how the electric grid actually got built. Yeah. It was built to be able to create businesses and job opportunities. Yeah. But then somewhere it got shifted around. People started working for capital. All of a sudden, Mm. people were there to produce in order to feed into the financial systems. And now we're basically trapped in this notion of investors and shareholders are at the top priority and everything else is subordinate to that. And so what I see is this, the push is basically a pushback on the current way to try to go back to putting capital to work for people rather than to put people to work for capital. Yeah. What are what are some of the ways that you are seeing people begin to put capital to work for people? So I've seen in Seattle again a couple of really interesting ways of getting that to work. A lot of them is communities coming together to help each other out. If yeah. you look at the history of the cooperative, it's actually about people coming together for capital. Uh, mm. The first cooperatives were formed actually back in England, the Rochdales. Mm. Um, society where they were people that did not have access to capital. So it was a community Mm. that came together to pool their own capital and created a cooperative such that everyone that was part of the cooperative actually benefited. Now, there's many problems to the cooperative models, but there's also many good things to the cooperative model. And the good thing about the cooperative model is a community of people coming Mm -hmm. together to try to create a very necessary business that they need. And so farmers co-ops are Mm. very prevalent in the U uh, in the U S yeah, just because of how rural they are. And there's co-ops of co-ops as different co-ops come together and realize that, Oh, you know, there's a lot of dairy, for instance, um, our co-ops where dairy farmers realize they need a dairy, uh, Mm -hmm. the milk, Depot and they'll these co-ops will come together to form that co-op. Same thing with food co-ops, all the way down into then the retail grocery store co-ops, which is probably what you and I are much more familiar with. Yeah. But that's to mm-hmm. give you an example, one possible way. It, it's yeah. a small sliver of how that works, but that's one particular model. That's so right, Jimmy. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. I mean, there's such deep thinking about how to structure the governance of a good co-op because it's been, as you said, the system of uh, energy cooperatives goes back to, I guess, what would be like the 60s or even earlier. I mean, when I was doing my thesis Much earlier. Much earlier, yeah. So when I was, or I guess probably more like the the 20s even, um, when I was doing my thesis on renewable energy market expansion policies in the U.S., What I I did was I grouped the policies by whether they were sort of community ownership or private ownership. And what I found was that in in most cases, 
you, you could get PPAs through things that were sort of specific to private ownership in kind of conservative states, but you could get kind of these more um, community choice aggregation, these more sort of cooperative based um, energy sharing policies um, through in these like liberal states, except there was this exception, which I found really cool, which was that there was the, the sort of belt um, of energy cooperatives that already existed in places that had been historically left out during the New Deal. So there was all these places that actually like the government kind of forgot about them. They said there's not enough people here. So there's these like deep rural kind of typically um, red state areas that are super cooperative and they have all these collaborations with like um, people in Africa that are starting to create energy cooperatives because they also don't have the government infrastructure in place. And I just thought that was such a beautiful and inspirational story to see how mutual aid and resilience and working together um, kind of precedes or supersedes politics that we think is drawn across just a line that is impossible to cross. You know, it reminds me of the whole centralization, decentralization debate mm -hmm. of which way do you want to go? Which way is yeah. more efficient? Yeah. And one of the things that struck me about Joaquin Viquez's interview yeah. about wastewater is that decentralized wastewater is a necessity for mm -hmm. nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. When you have large centralized wastewater treatment, it might be more efficient, but then you have to throw energy and chemicals at it in order yeah. to extract all the, the, the biologics and the contaminants out of it. But if it's less centralized and much more dispersed, then each locality can use nature-based solutions to be able to treat that wastewater. I mean, to me, that was, I hear far more about centralization strategies and decentralization strategies. And this was one of the things that struck me was a very good case for decentralization strategy. Yeah, you know, I, I really heard that from Joaquin because he talked about how he would, you know, work with the regional and then national governments to figure out what sort of the policy and incentive structures were. But it wasn't until he was kind of, again, interviewing the, the restaurant owner who had to implement or dealing with some of the major land use issues that come with sort of a more centralized strategy that he realized that they needed to create a new smaller um, treatment facility. But I do think, so this is a debate that I, I almost wrote my thesis. This is the beauty of being an academic is you write like 15 proposals and then you learn. But um, I almost wrote my thesis about how decentralized um, energy systems are sort of like the solution that we need to, to go with because I was so inspired by these energy cooperatives and, and the energy democracy movement. But then I kind of counted up, uh, there's someone had created a database of sort of all the energy democracy hubs in the world. And it accounted for such a tiny, tiny proportion of our total energy demands across the world. And I thought, well, shoot, like I need to be looking at government strategies as well that are helping to facilitate decentralized and centralized solutions because we need both. There's no sort of one way to 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 solve this problem. And so um, where I've really come to is that we really need support and we need that that high level financing from government at a national level and at a regional level. But we need to have kind of the legal and regulatory arrangements that empower communities to help make the best decisions that exist for them. And, you know, one really obvious example where decentralized energy systems in particular make the most sense are like islands, right? Because they're, if you think about Puerto Rico and the storm, it, it, the, we couldn't fix the grid because it was just taking too long. And so it was only the energy cooperatives and the decentralized energy systems that were saving people and refrigerating medicine and stuff right after the storm. And that would have been a disaster if those hadn't existed. And it, it, frankly, it was a disaster where they didn't across the island. So it's a combination, I think. You know, and kind of a good hybrid of an island centralized system is Australia. Yeah. When we start thinking of Australia, physically, it is an island in terms of its cutoff from the rest of you know, the major land masses, <laughs> but it's large enough to also build its own centralized grid. Now, yeah. Stuart Hillen works for Energy Australia, which is one of the largest uh, utility companies in Australia, looking at basically some of these hybrid solutions as well yeah. as these centralized, decentralized solutions, and then financing them and having to bring money in to be able to, yeah. to pay for it all. Yeah. What were some of your takeaways of that conversation? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I just have so, so much respect for minds like Stuart's who are thinking through, you know, grid solutions. And that's another reason that de that centralized systems are important, right? Because we need to have the financing and the money to support people like Stuart in thinking through these 
kind of problems at a, at a really high level and at a level that then we can scale out to other people. Um, I, I appreciate problem solvers, right? So he's, he's saying, okay, there's a storage issue here. Uh, how can we kind of level that out? That's, we just, I think that we do need a certain amount of like pooled resources to sort of figure some of those things out. Um, and, and smart grids are just like the way of the future, right? We need, we need to invest heavily in that right now, every single country. And I think that the green recovery work that Oxford has done has shown that we're not investing in that enough. I used to know the uh, CTO of Seattle City Light, and he was, mm -hmm. this was back in the day when he was responsible for the electric vehicle rollout and the infrastructure rollout. Yeah. And he told me this story once of how he was talking to a car manufacturer and the car was trying to convince the car manufacturers trying to convince him to put charging stations all around Seattle sidewalks. And okay. he was trying to broker that deal and, and make it happen. And the manufacturing company at some point said, like, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to be the plug that we want to install. And don't worry, it'll we'll only update it every five to six years or so as the models of the car changes. And no. to the, which the CTO goes, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm going to dig up my sidewalk, I'm not going to change it for 30 years. So if you're telling me that you're going to mm -hmm. update your charging mm -hmm. model every five to six <clears throat> years, I'm not going to put you into my sidewalk. Yeah. And so it was something that Stuart, I thought, talked really well to was technology can be anywhere from six month cycles. We think yeah. of apps on our cell phone. Yeah. But utilities need to think in 30-year, 50-year infrastructure yeah. cycles. And bringing those two cycles together takes a lot of forethought and planning. It also takes a lot of social work to get companies that are fundamentally competitive with each other and not wanting to share their technology uh, to, to standardize. I mean, this is going to be a huge issue if the UK has just launched its 2035 target to phase out uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Well, right now, my partner has a, an electric vehicle and he'll go in, and charge it up, but he's got to, every single charging station has a different system, a different input, and sometimes he has to switch out the, the toggle on the, the plug. So it's like, you know, we're not we're not there yet. And standardization is just one of those things that requires so much um you know, not only so much systems thinking and, and kind of engineering solutions, but also sort of people going around and saying, we really need to work together, guys. It reminds me of the whole USB, micro USB, yeah. Ethernet, kind of the yeah. standards that the internet went through for communications protocol back five, 10 years ago. Yeah. We're in the, I think we're in the waning years of it as we start to see convergence, but even that convergence is around maybe two to three standards instead of five or six standards. Thinking about, you know, you go to a friend's house and they've got a, a, an Android versus an Apple phone and you're out of power for the night. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing, though. <laughs> not <laughs> not as much if you uh, have to drive home. But, you know, maybe we'll spend more time on each other's couches. It's That couldn't be so bad from a, <laughs> the, our last conversation about, you know, staying up late and talking to our college mates and solving the world that way. Yeah, that's true. I remember uh, it, it in graduate school having an apartment where for the first month, it took us a month to get our internet worked out and TV worked out. And so for about three weeks, me and my housemates, we just talked to each other. And it yeah. was some of our favorite memories where we didn't have yeah. internet, we didn't have TV, and we just talked every single day. It was great. Well, exactly. And this is something that I think COVID has sort of reminded us of some of our core values. I mean, you know, it's also frustrated us and it will create a backlash. But there's so many things and people being in parks, just it's so beautiful to see people in nature, just at every corner of a park, enjoying and talking to each other. And, you know, maybe actually a huge part of the climate reset is cultural in that way as well as us getting more comfortable with inconveniences. It, let's say that we don't perfectly figure out the storage system, but we know we have to move faster. Let's say we're dealing with rolling brownouts. Now there's all kinds of reasons why we'd want to avoid that, especially medical reasons. And, you know, there's so many systems that rely on, on power, but there are definitely some things, heating in particular, we, we just turn on the heating at the easiest convenience rather than putting on a sweater. W what if we learned a little bit from what if we shook up our climate socioeconomic system to mitigate climate 
and we actually caused ourselves some inconveniences. Now, we have to be very careful sociopolitically with that, that we don't cause so much backlash that then climate becomes toxic. But maybe we don't ca- we don't call these climate changes. Maybe we call these just like, you know, transition changes or something. And um, I don't know, that's something that I think about a lot is like, how can we learn from our inconveniences as we transition? And uh, how much can we push people in that urgency? Yeah, it, it's to me, it's not so much inconveniences as it is just a thoughtful way of living, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you do see that in a lot of movements already, whether yeah. it's the the uh, the essentialism movement, the, the Marie Kondo simplify your life yeah. movement. Yeah, all of these kind of mantras already exist as a way of making life better, essentially. Or you go to the stilling of the mind, the Indian tradition, yeah. the yo- yoga traditions. These already exist, but yet they kind of resist exist in pockets, I think. Yes. And yes. to me, a lot of that type of thought is very interesting and attractive because fundamentally they are sustainable underneath it all. Exactly. Because if you can kind of go into yourself and, and develop that personal resilience, which I know we've all had to develop to lesser or or better degrees in lockdown, then then we will be able to, you know, that's the, the strength source from which everything comes. And I think, you know, Shruti really brought me back there. I was so grateful to to listen to her speak about that. Even the pace at which she talks sort of got me into a state of mind that was, I think, healthier. And I think it's interesting that, especially in Western society, we are looking towards these other traditions. And I say, I say we as a, you know, a North American European descent person, there, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from the indigenous communities where, where I'm from and where we're from in Seattle. And, um, and I see a lot of Western people doing that, saying there's something that feels off about me in relation to this society. Let me look towards other cultures that are maybe not, that maybe don't come from such convenience or such development. And that really shows that even people who kind of are winners in this society are sensing a kind of emotional and spiritual disconnect in how we're living just because we have everything at our fingertips. But we're somehow we've got all these anxiety disorders. We've got all of this stuff that, you know, we're on our phones late at night and we can't shake certain habits. So we're turning to these communities that, uh, you know, have had less and have come, you know, and, and are very much richer in certain ways. I think that just really, really shows us that if we don't connect up our global solutions on climate change uh, and think globally about climate change, that we are, we're going to continue to miss out um, in many, many ways. It reminds me of a Japanese koan, one of my favorite Japanese Zen koans, which is a monk, he's you know, who doesn't have very much. He's sitting, he's meditating uh, at night in front of a lake uh, with the moon rising off in the distance and a thief happens to come by. And the thief comes up, you know, climbs up the mountain, finds the, and realizes that it, it's a monk. And the thief is very apologetic and says, oh, I'm so sorry for, for disturbing you. And the monk says, oh, no, no, for your troubles, I should give you something because you came to rob me. But I have nothing. I'm a monk. Here, take my clothes. And so he takes off all his clothes and gives his clothes to the thief. And the thief runs away. And the monk is then sitting there naked, meditating, thinking, man, I wish I could give him the the moonlight. And to me, that's very beautiful to think about Mm -hmm. the materialistic versus just understanding and appreciating what is around us. That is uh, that is so gorgeous. Um, my my mom and dad um, lived in Japan before I was born, and so um, I grew up with this painting that my mom did um, on my wall um, about a story that had she, someone in Japan had told her. And I don't actually maybe you know it, but I, I have no idea where it comes from. But it's a similar tale, or this woman um, has these kind of royal clothes and she goes out into the street and she sees a lot of suffering and so she just starts giving away her clothes to people um, and she's out in the woods she's walked all the way across town and she's given away everything that she is wearing and in the story butterflies come and surround her and clothe her mm-hmm. and and that was the painting that my mom did was just uh, that hung on my wall for my entire childhood it was just like a woman's covered in a, a butterfly robe um mm-hmm. Very beautiful, very beautiful. 
Well, Kaya, thank you so much for joining us. This has been great to talk about some of the recordings and the podcast for this season and to get some commentary and to hear about your work. Jimmy, it, it was such a gift to me to like take again to take that time and listen to some people who I know, some of whom I know, and others who I really respect and admire. And um, so, really grateful to you for convening this conversation. And I hope we get to continue to make time to catch up in this way. Absolutely. All right. Take care. See you next time. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and visit our website at loversofexchange.com for more podcasts and other information. See you next time.